Hello and welcome to the online lecture covering the topics of electric potential energy and electric potential for general physics 2. Electric potential I guess I would categorize as the second abstract difficult to think about concept that we introduce in this electrostatics unit. The first being the concept of an electric field. But again, like an electric field, it's a construct that physicists have um, put together that allows them to think about certain types of problems and certain types of physical situations um, in an easier fashion. And it turns out if you've studied anything about electric circuits or worked with that concept before, um, the idea of voltage is actually a change in electric potential and that's something we'll use quite frequently throughout our circuits unit and beyond. But I'm going to start similar to how I did the previous discussion talking about electric field by talking about the concept of electric potential energy and contrasting the gravitational uh, concept with gravitational potential energy to a new concept called electric potential energy. To do so, however, we're going to need the definition from Physics 1 of work, and I would be unsurprised if many of you have forgotten what that is. Uh, and so we define work, uh, symbolized here with a W, as being equal to uh, the product of the force that's applied to something times the displacement that that object undergoes times the cosine of the angle between the force vector and the displacement vector. What that means is if I exert a force on an object and the object moves in the direction of my force, uh, the angle between the force vector and the displacement vector would be zero and you get the maximum amount of work because the cosine of zero gives you one. If you exert a force on an object that's opposite in direction to the displacement of the object, so say something was already sliding and you pushed opposite direction to slow it down, uh, that situation you would have negative work because the angle between the force vector and the displacement vector would be 180 degrees and the cosine of 180 degrees is minus one. So let's imagine uh, a basketball that is moving from position A up here at a certain height above the floor to a position B uh, closer to the floor. Well how much work does gravity do on the basketball as it falls. Well, again, applying this definition, work is equal to the magnitude of the force, so that's m times g, the, uh, how you calculate the gravitational force. The displacement, which is just the magnitude of the difference between those two positions, so hb minus ha gives me the displacement here. And let's see, the force vector is in the downward direction. In this particular situation, the displacement is in the downward direction, so the cosine of the angle between the force vector and the displacement vector uh, gives me a cosine of zero degrees or one uh, for the um, angle term in the work definition. Another thing to recall from physics one is that by definition we said that the work done by gravity on an object was equal to the negative of the change in the gravitational potential energy of the system. Uh, and uh, at least in my course, we use U for gravitational potential energy or any kind of potential energy. Um, if you use a different symbol, it's absolutely fine to do that. But this is a fundamental and useful definition that the work done by a force is, uh, in this case, a gravitational force, is equal to the negative of the change in the gravitational potential energy of the system. Well, uh, that means that um, while this ball is moving vertically, either up or down, its gravitational potential energy is changing, and you can calculate how big that gravitational potential energy change is by multiplying the object's mass by this g, the acceleration due to gravity or the strength of the gravitational field, and then the uh, difference in height. And if, as is shown in this picture, we move from position A to position B, then the change in height, which would be hb minus ha, is going to be negative because hb is smaller than ha. And that would say that as the basketball falls towards the ground, the change in the gravitational potential energy of the system, which consists of the basketball and the earth, is negative. If the basketball were to reverse course and rise, uh, the 
change in height term in this uh, equation would be positive since I would be increasing in height and the gravitational potential energy of the ball earth system in that case would be increasing. Well now we're going to think about a parallel situation with um, some electrical charges. So what I'm imagining here is that I have um, a series of positive charges that are uniformly distributed and a series of negative charges that are uniformly distributed. Now we haven't explicitly addressed this scenario before but it turns out uh, if you have a large positive flat sheet of charge on one side and a large negative flat sheet of charge on the other side that in the region in between here the electric field is uh, fairly uniform and you see this uh, in the lab that involves mapping the equipotential lines which is coming up shortly. Um, so uh, a similar scenario I have a test charge that has a charge of Q naught. Uh, it's force that it feels at this location is equal to the magnitude of the charge times the electric field uh, and it falls some distance and if the electric field is uniform then it's going to feel the same amount of force at position B than it did at position A. The work done by the electric field in this situation uh, is again the force that is applied to this charge so that's QE in this case for the electric case the displacement is the magnitude of the difference between the heights and again if this thing fell in this direction it would have a displacement that was in the direction of the um, force that is applied on it so the angle between the force vector and the displacement vector would be zero uh, cosine of zero is one uh, and therefore the work in this case would be QE times uh, the delta H term. Work is again uh, equated to the negative of the change in potential energy so in this case we're saying we're going to define this this um, quantity called electrical potential energy and use uh, a similar definition to what we did gravitationally we're going to say whatever this electrical potential energy is of a system its change as an object moves from one configuration to another configuration is equal to the negative of the work done on that object by an electric field and similarly to what we did over here on the gravitational side we can write that the change in electric potential energy uh, on a point charge moving in an electric field is therefore the magnitude of the point charge times the magnitude of the electric field times the uh, change in height uh, that this thing moves through imagining that here is height B and here is height A similar to the basketball picture so if I move uh, downward where my delta H is negative uh, then my gravitational potential energy would be uh, decrease um, excuse me my electrical potential energy of my system would be decreasing if and here's an important uh, place where this gets a little more tricky than the gravitational case if the charge is positive so if the charge is moving in this direction which you'll note is the natural direction that charge would want to go if it were positive because it want to get away from this positive plate and towards this negative plate then the electric potential energy is said to be decreasing. If however it moved from A to B and the charge were negative um, then you would say that the electrical potential energy would be increasing in that situation because uh, delta H would be negative but Q would be negative and those two negatives would give you a positive change in electrical potential energy. So in many ways if you've thought previously about gravitational potential energy but energy by moving a mass around relative to the earth you can use many of those same uh, ideas to think about charges moving around relative to other charged objects when you're thinking about electrical potential energy. We use electrical potential energy to define electric potential and we do it in this way um, just a reminder from the previous discussion that we found it convenient to define an electric field uh, in terms of force so the electric field was defined to be the force that a charge felt divided by the magnitude of that test charge itself and we're going to do uh, a very similar thing with electric potential and electric potential energy well um, why did we use this definition well one of the reasons again for um, building this concept of an electric field is it allows us to once we know what the electric field is we don't have to think about 
uh, what is causing that electric field. And in the case of lots of charges distributed in some sort of pattern, uh, that's more convenient than calculating all of the individual forces. Another reason is that the electric field is going to be a constant um, of a location in space. It's going to be a constant property of some location in space. So it's independent of how much charge might be there. If I'm one centimeter away from a charged rod, that electric field has the same strength at that location regardless of whether that point in space is unoccupied or if I put a one nanocoulomb test charge there or a two nanocoulomb test charge there, what have you. Um, so we're going to do a similar thing in defining this concept of electric potential. We're going to say we want to make a quantity uh, related to electric potential energy that is independent of the magnitude of the actual charge uh, at a given location. And we're going to call this electric potential. Change in electric potential is going to be determined in reference to the change in electric potential energy because as of yet all we've talked about is defining a change in electric potential energy in terms of the work done by an electric field. Uh, towards the end of this we will talk about formulas for actually calculating electric potential energy and electric potential if you're dealing with point charges. Um, so change in electric potential energy divided by charge. If you prefer to write things symbolically, electric potential gets assigned the symbol V. So delta V would be the change in electric potential. The change in electric potential energy would be delta U uh, in this particular case. And I might add electric as a subscript to remind myself what kind of potential energy I'm dealing with divided by uh, the magnitude of the test charge Q0. Well, since the change in electric potential energy is equal to the negative of the work done by the electric field, you can also write uh, the change in electric potential is equal to the negative of the work done by an electric field uh, divided by the magnitude of the test charge that you're moving in that electric field. Electric potential often, in fact, uh, gets called just potential. Uh, and electric potential difference is often called potential difference, particularly when we move into talking about uh, electric circuits. But the reason for this becomes, uh, in circuits, becomes more obvious because when we get to circuits, rather than talking about the exact amount of energy that a circuit has uh, between two different locations, you can talk about uh, the change in electric potential, which is independent of the actual amount of charge that you're pushing through that electric circuit. More on that later when we get into our second unit. Electric potential or electric potential difference has units of volts and one volt uh, in terms of things we've seen before is equal to then one joule, a unit of energy, divided by one coulomb, a unit of charge. So let's solve uh, a problem based on the definitions that we've built up so far before we move on into uh, other ideas about electric potential. Uh, so we're told in this situation that the work done by an electric force as a test charge, uh, which is 2 microcoulomb in this particular case, uh, moves between two points is 5 times 10 to the negative fifth joules. So I have some sort of test charge that I'm moving between two points, and there is work done by an electric force on that test charge. So we want to find the difference in electric potential energies of the charge between these points, and determine the electric potential difference between these points. You don't have to do it, but I always find it convenient to sketch a picture so I can say what, what in the world does this all mean in terms of what I imagine it looks like. So here's location A, here's location B. I have this little test charge and something is moving that test charge from A to B. And if I were fancier with the slides, I'd figure out how to animate that, but I'm not. So, uh, our definition, again, is the work done on this uh, test charge is equal to the negative change in potential energy of the system. Uh, shorthand or symbolically, you can write W equals minus delta U. The work is equal to 5 times 10 to the minus 5th joules, and that just comes from the problem statement itself. That means the change in electric potential energy has to be the negative of that, or negative 5 times 10 to the minus 5th joules. So as the charge is pushed along, whatever the force is that's acting on it is doing 5 times 10 to the minus 5th joules. 
uh, and that means relative to whatever potential energy the system had when the charge was over here at A, the electric potential energy of the system has dropped by 5 times 10 to the minus 5th joules by the time the charge gets over here at point B. Alright, what is the electric potential difference between these two points? Well, electric potential difference we've just defined as being the change in electric potential energy divided by the charge. The change in electric potential energy uh, in this particular case is what we just deduced here, minus 5 times 10 to the minus 5th joules per coulomb. And uh, the charge we're given in the problem statement is 2 microcoulombs, or 2 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. And if you do the math there, you get minus 25 uh, joules per coulomb, or minus 25 volts, if you want to write it in the more standard units. And that just means the potential difference between point A and point B uh, is, is 25 volts. And if you move from point A to point B, you decrease in electric potential by that amount. Again, we'll see this concept much more in our circuits unit. All right, so now we want to think about these two abstract things that we've defined and played around with their definitions a little bit, that, that concept of electric field and now this concept of electric potential. So let's think about the definition of electric potential applied to a charge uh, that is going to be moving within an electric field. So in this diagram, these uh, lines are supposed to represent the electric field, and given that they're parallel to one another, that would tell you that, at least in this region, the electric field is of uniform strength. Here's a little test charge, Q0. It's going to feel a force equal to Q0 times E, the strength of the electric field over here, and we're moving a displacement delta S to move from this location to this location. Well, the work done on that test charge is equal to the magnitude of the force uh, times the magnitude, which is the QE, times the displacement times, and I've uh, omitted it here, uh, though I put it back in the next line, so there should be a cosine theta in here as well. Uh, but the force in this case is to the right, the displacement's to the right, so that angle between them is going to be zero, uh, giving me a uh, cosine of zero, which is one. Well, uh, the change in electric potential is defined as the negative of the work done divided by the charge. That comes from the change in electric potential being defined as the change in electric potential energy. And the change in electric potential energy is the negative of the work. So we got that. Let's see. So the work is the charge times the electric field times the displacement. And here's the cosine theta that I should have had in the term up here as well. Uh, divided by the magnitude of the test charge, and lo and behold, those test charges cancel out uh, of the numerator and denominator of this equation, leaving us with the change in electric potential is equal to the negative of the magnitude of the electric field times the displacement times the cosine of the angle between the electric field and the displacement, which means if I move with the electric field, which is shown in this diagram, uh, I'm dropping in electric potential. I'm getting to lower and lower values of electric potential. Just like if you move with the gravitational field, which by the way you do if you are, oh, jumping out of an airplane and skydiving and getting closer and closer to the Earth, uh, the gravitational potential energy of the system consisting of you and the Earth is decreasing. If I move the charge from here to here, so right to left, uh, then the angle between the displacement, which would be to the left, and the force, which would be to the right, would be 180 degrees. Cosine of 180 degrees is minus 1, and that would be an increase in electric potential doing that. If I move uh, perpendicular to the field so that the displacement is vertical and the field is horizontal, the angle between the two of those is 90 degrees. Cosine of 90 is 0. And that's a situation where I have no change in electric potential. If, uh, though, we go back to this scenario, and they're both in the same direction, so that cosine theta gives me 1, uh, then we can rearrange that equation to say the electric field is equal to the negative of the change in electric potential energy divided by uh, the distance. And this is a relationship now that is tying the concept of electric field to the concept of the change in electric potential. Uh, and so what that means is 
as you're moving with or against an electric field, your electric potential of the system is changing. And it furthermore means that the electric field can be found by taking the slope of a graph that shows electric potential plotted as a function of position. So we'll see that graph idea here in a slide, uh, but first another sample problem relating electric field and potential. So here's a situation where we now have, again, a uniform electric field, but it's pointing to the left, and it's uh, we're given the magnitude of it, 1,200 newtons per coulomb, and we have this uh, little triangle that we're going to move around here. So we want to find what the difference in electric potential is between points B and C, and then between points C and A, finally between A and B, getting back to B where we started this little journey. And then from the information given in this problem, can we determine the actual value of the electric potential at point A? If so, what is it? If not, explain why we can't do this. Well, from B to C, the change in electric potential using that formula that we put together on the previous slide is equal to the negative of the magnitude of the electric field times the magnitude of the displacement times the cosine of the angle between the electric field uh, and the displacement. So the electric field, uh, well, I guess I did this a little funny um, because I have the 1200 newtons per coulomb as the direction of the electric field in here. It would be easier, uh, and I've said cosine of theta with theta being zero here, so cosine of theta is one. Uh, it would be easier actually if I said just the magnitude of the electric field, which is to the left, so this is 1200 newtons per coulomb. The displacement's to the right, so that's the 40 centimeters, and they're in opposite directions, hence cosine of theta uh, gives you the 180 degrees. But if I plug in the actual direction of the electric field, I'll get the same result. The negative and the negative will uh, cancel each other out. Uh, and I end up with an increase in electric potential of 48 volts moving from B to C. Again, if I move from uh, a rather opposite to the direction of the electric field, my electric potential increases in value. If I go from C to A, similar thing, I have the electric field, the displacement, the cosine, the angle between them. Well, what is that angle between the electric field and the displacement here? Well, it's whatever this angle is right here. I have my 3, 4, 5 triangle. Uh, and theta can be found by using your favorite trig function if you know all the sides of this triangle. I chose sine. Sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So the sine of this angle is 3 over 5. That means theta is the inverse uh, of that, the inverse sine, rather, of 3 fifths, and that's 37 degrees. Using that information, we've got the 1,200 newtons per coulomb, and here I went back the way I should have done this, which is just the field magnitude times the magnitude of the displacement, the 5 centimeters, but I converted it to meters, times the cosine of the 37 degrees, which is the angle between them, and I find that the change in electric potential between C and A is minus 48 volts. So as I'm moving from C to A, I'm dropping in electric potential by 48 volts. A to B, a uh, very similar calculation, but now my displacement is vertical. My electric field is horizontal. The angle between them is 90 degrees. So that means the cosine of the angle between them gives me zero, and there is, in fact, no change in electric potential going from A to B. Is it possible to figure out the value of the actual electric potential at point A? And the answer is no. All that what we've done to date will allow us to do is to figure out the change in electric potential between two points, because we've related that to the work done by an electric field we can't figure out the actual value at point A unless we know something about what object or objects are creating this electric field. Uh, and at that, this point, we don't have that information included. All right, so back to the graph idea. If I have a plot of electric potential as a function of position, and the electric potential, first it starts out at about 8 volts, and then after 15 centimeters drops to 6 volts, uh, up to 25 centimeters seems to remain constant at 6 volts, then up to the 60 centimeter mark increases back to the 8 volt 
uh, amount and then drops off towards zero as we move out to 70 centimeters. Um, recall that the electric field is equal to the negative of the change in potential divided by the displacement or the negative of the slope of a potential versus position graph. So in this graph, in which regions would the magnitude of the electric field uh, be the greatest? Uh, and I would encourage you to pause this video and think about it and come to an answer before you listen onward. So the magnitude of the electric field being the greatest means I can ignore the negative sign and I'm looking for the place where this slope term is the greatest. Well, that just means where is the slope the steepest on the graph and it should be fairly obvious that region 4 is the place where the slope is the steepest. Hence, that will be where the electric field is the strongest. In which region or regions is the electric field the greatest? Well, now notice we've scrubbed the word magnitude from here and removing the word magnitude means we have to pay attention to signs. So which, where do we have the electric field being the greatest, meaning the most positive? Well, here in region one, the slope is negative but the electric field is the negative of that slope, which means in region 1 the electric field is in the positive x direction. In region 2 we get no electric field. In region 3, while the electric potential is increasing, that means the electric field is pointing in the opposite direction. Uh, and so the electric field in region 3 is pointing in the negative x direction. Finally, we get to region 4. It has a negative slope. That means it has a positive electric field, and so the answer to the second question is, in fact, identical to the first. Region 4 also has uh, the same amount of electric, or the, rather, is also the greatest uh, electric field. It's, all, it's both the greatest in magnitude and the greatest overall, since it's the most positive. What's the numerical value of the electric field in, any, in a region? And I just chose region 3 as an example. Well, uh, let's see, it starts at 25 centimeters and it goes up to 60 centimeters. So the difference here is uh, 35 centimeters or 0.35 meters. The uh, change in electric potential would be 2 volts. So you'd plug that into the definition and you'd have 2 volts over um, 0.35 meters or I don't know what that is off the top of my head. That's going to be very roughly uh, 6, but slightly off of 6 uh, volts per meter, uh, which is uh, an equivalent unit for writing electric field in, uh, equivalent to newtons per coulomb, which we've done previously. Uh, here's another sample problem, thinking about a charged particle. So I have a charged particle, in this case it's negative 1.5 uh, microcoulombs, has a mass of 2.5 times 10 to the minus 6 kilograms, or I guess we could say 2.5 micro kilograms. No, micro kilograms, just be milligrams, yeah. Uh, and it's released from rest at point A and accelerates towards point B, arriving at point B with a speed of 42 meters a second. So, What's the potential difference between points A and point B? And what point is at the higher value of electric potential? Again, not mandatory, but I find it useful in these situations to draw a little sketch to help me visualize what I'm thinking about. So here's point A, some location in space, and I'm taking this charged particle uh, and releasing it from rest at this location. It's traveling across. Um, by the time it gets over here at B, it's going 42 meters a second. And at first glance, it looks like we don't know enough about this situation because, for example, we don't know um, uh, how far apart these two points are. So if we don't know how far apart the two points are, we don't know a displacement. We don't know how big the force is on this thing, so we can't figure out how much work is done. Well, it turns out we don't need to use the concept of work here. We can go back to another friend from Physics 1, the idea of conservation of mechanical energy. And recall from your Physics 1 uh, work that conservation of mechanical energy says that in certain systems where mechanical energy is conserved, and there are uh, ways to think about whether it is or it isn't, but a big one where it's not is if there is friction acting on the object within the system. Uh, but here, 
we're imagining this is friction free and this in turn is, in fact is a situation where we can say mechanical energy is conserved so what that means is the mechanical energy that the system has here at point A has to equal the mechanical energy that the system has at point B and recall that mechanical energy is the sum of the object's kinetic energy and all forms of the system's potential energies that exist. In this case, it's just going to be electric potential energy that we have to worry about. So we can do something like, say, the kinetic energy at point A plus the electric potential energy of the system when the charge is at point A is equal to the kinetic energy at B plus the electric potential energy of the system uh, when the charge is at part B. And we've previously defined electric potential to be electric potential energy divided by charge, even though we mostly worked with a definition that said change in electric potential is equal to the change in electric potential energy divided by charge. Um, so you could write that as V equals U over Q. Again, you can write delta V equals delta U over Q as well. Um, and that means then that the electric potential energy at any given point is equal to the charge times the value of the electric potential of that point. All right, so we're going to use that in our energy equation. Uh, so let's see, at point A, there's no velocity, so that means the kinetic energy at point A is zero. That means there's just electric potential energy at A, and the electric potential energy can be found by multiplying the amount of charge by the value of the electric potential at A, even though we don't know what it is yet. Uh, equals now when you get to B there is kinetic energy for the particle because it's moving at 42 meters a second so its kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared and the electric potential energy at B is similarly to what it was here at A it's the charge times the electric potential at point B uh, so I'm going to get all the things that have electric potential on one side of the equation and all of the things that are kinetic energies on the other side of the equation. And since the problem is asking me to find VB minus VA, I'm going to move the VA term over to the right, I'm going to move the kinetic energy at B term over to the left, and I'll get minus one half MVB squared equals QVB minus QVA. Uh, and so um, you can pull Q out of both of those terms and you get Q times V me minus VA well lo and behold there is your electric potential difference between points A and B to find out a value for that we divide both sides of the equation by Q and therefore the change in electric potential energy VB minus VA is equal to minus one half the mass times the velocity at B squared divided by uh, the charge if we plug in numbers there, that's minus um, one half, but I've moved the two to the denominator here. So here's the mass, 2.5 times 10 to the minus six kilograms. The speed is 42 meters a second. You have to square that. And here's the charge, the 1.5 times 10 to the minus six. The negative, however, here is important, and the negatives end up canceling out. Uh, and we get a positive result, saying the electric potential at point B is 1470 volts higher uh, than it is at point A which seems a little counterintuitive here when we're asked to think about which point is at the higher potential but you know VB minus VA is positive and that means VB is greater than VA and one of the things to think about uh, as you're thinking about this situation is uh, this is uh, there would be an electric field that would be pushing this charge along and uh, if the charge moved along with the electric field, it moves from regions of high electric potential to regions of low electric potential. Uh, but here's a situation where we've just said we're going from low electric potential to high electric potential. How can that be? Well, the how can that be hinges on the fact that this is a negative particle. And negative particles naturally move against the electric field. So if this thing is going to be accelerating and speeding up, that's telling you that the electric field in this region is actually pointing back to the left, and this negative charge is moving opposite to the direction of the electric field. Uh, so it moves against the electric field, and that means it's going to higher and higher and higher values of electric potential. If you recall the connection between electric field 
and electric potential difference that we had a couple of slides back. Uh, so a word here at the end about point charges um, uh, and uh, the derivation here is not going to be included because you actually have to have some calculus to do this but we should talk about it briefly anyway. Uh, if you take a positive test charge and you release it from rest it's going to uh, accelerate away from another positive charge and so as those two things get further and further apart that is a decrease in the electric potential energy even as the kinetic energy of the moving test charge is increasing and so that's another application of conservation of mechanical energy so if I have this fixed charge right here and I take a little test charge not moving here as it speeds away to point B uh, it would be undergoing a the system would be undergoing a decrease in electric potential energy and so that change in electric potential energy uh, can be shown to be equal to um, K, which is that same Coulomb constant that we had from Coulomb's law, times the magnitude of the test charge times the magnitude of the fixed charge here at the origin, divided by the distance that separates them when the test charge is at point A, minus, same Coulomb constant, same magnitude of the test charge, same magnitude of that charge fixed at the origin divided by now the distance when uh, the moving test charge is at position B. Um, and you can determine the corresponding change in electric potential since the change in electric potential energy divided by the charge is equal to the change in electric potential. So we get this change in electric potential or VA minus VB is equal to the change in electric potential energy UA minus UB divided by the magnitude of that test charge, well that's going to drop the Q0 term out of what we had up here, leaving you just with K times Q, the magnitude of the charge that I've fixed at the origin, divided by R, and the difference here between point A and point B. Uh, some people then find it helpful to draw these little um, three-dimensional graphs that help you visualize what electric potential looks like in the region of a point charge. So the one on the left here is a positive point charge at the origin and this would say that uh, when you are at the origin you can't actually calculate the value of electric potential but if you're very close to the origin R is small and that makes this uh, term large so the electric potential is large near the charge and then it drops off as you move away from the test charge in any direction. If you have a negative test charge it's sort of like inverting that shape the value of the electric potential actually as you approach that test charge gets to a lower and lower and lower value because Q is negative in all of those calculations. Which means we've arrived at this place which uh, could be considered somewhat of a formula nightmare uh, and the good news is you don't have to memorize these formulas. Uh, these are all for point charges and they allow us to do exact calculations and they all involve some combination of K's, Q's and R's. First, we defined Coulomb's law and the law, uh, the, the, the idea of the electric force between interacting charges. Then we said, well, electric field is force divided by the magnitude of one of those charges. So one of the Q's drops out and the electric field near a point charge is given by K times Q over R squared. And again, we did not derive this here. You have to have some calculus to derive this actual result but you can show via calculus that electric potential energy can be calculated using the Coulomb constant, the product of the two charges, and R, which is the distance between them. When you're talking about electric potential at a point, again, due just to a point charge, uh, it turns out to be KQ over R. Uh, and so it's helpful at some place to, in fact, write these down so you're not trying to memorize, all right, how many Qs, how many Rs, but you do need to pay attention to what a particular problem is asking you to calculate. Is it asking you to calculate potential or potential energy? Is it asking you to calculate field or force? Uh, and so just read carefully, I guess, would be the word to the wise. So this concludes the lecture on electric potential energy and electric potential. Again, the hope is that this is a useful resource for you. And please notify me if you note any errors in the presentation. Thanks.